I'd be overseas for weeks without a phone and just that hit of adrenaline being so immersed in, in what I was doing was just instantly addictive to me. I'm in this place where you've got bombs going off a mile away, you've got snipers hanging out on rooftops, you've nobody to turn to, you've nobody who can help you. If you get into a tricky situation, you've got to get yourself out of it. From that moment forward, I was detained as an illegal drug trafficker in one of the world's strictest police states. The lawyer sat in as well and said, okay, you got two choices is 30 days in jail or Ollie welcome to the show thanks for joining me thanks Colin pleasure to be here and your adventure up to Glasgow probably a lot less adventurous than some of the things that we're going to get onto <laughs> but delighted you here all, all the same and I want to know when did you start to create this identity as somebody that is an adventurer yeah, interesting question. I mean, I can sort of look back to my childhood and see elements of it. Not that I would ever have considered myself an adventurer, you know, but I think I had this adventurous spirit in, in some ways in that, although I grew up in this working class uh, rugby league town in, in Northern England, Wigan, um, you know, I did love just being out there with my mates, going out into forests and fields and exploring and getting up to a bit of mischief. But there was something there, there was something that was sort of compelling me to get out and explore. Um, and it was only really oh, in my sort of late teens when I discovered the outdoor industry and outdoor, the outdoor world really and thought, hmm, maybe this could be a career. <laughs> like I'd never considered that it could be. Um, to sort of call myself an adventurer, I think came later down the line in my mid twenties, maybe when actually I, I started to turn that into a career. Still to this day, to think of it as a career kind of baffles me, but <laughs> believe it or not, I, yeah, it, it is about at that point now. That's what you've crafted yourself into. But yeah, it's interesting what you say, like so many of my guests, I look back to things that they were interested in in childhood and before the kind of pressures came on of society to conform in a particular way or particular regard or even just maybe they couldn't quite see that path yeah. ahead because like you say it's very hard to visualize what you're doing now because yeah. probably through social media the internet reach different platforms that you can build you've opened up those doors versus things that potentially weren't available to you before but if even like just charging about in the outdoors as a, as a, mm -hmm. as a teenager there is a hint there at some of the stuff that you've gone on to do. Yeah, that, that's right. And if you don't know something exists, how could you ever visualize doing it? Uh, and that's exactly what it was for me. I, I just didn't see this as a, as a possible career path at all. Like, it was not on my radar. But actually, if I'd have sat down as a young person and written down all the things I enjoy, all the things I'm passionate about, probably would have resembled what I do now, just didn't know it existed. Um, and, and you're right. And I think so often in the, in the modern world, people aren't doing careers which are conventional. It's very much kind of building a career or you've got different strands, you've spinning different plates. I find that really interesting. Uh, and I do think that's quite a generational thing, um, which I see a lot, uh, amongst a lot of my peers actually. Yeah, there's probably elements of it. We can talk negatively about elements of technology, but technology has 100% opened up a lot of these different things. Um, I recently hosted a gentleman, Andrew Craig, on the podcast, and his focus is very much in the financial world. But he talks about the development of civilization and humanity over the last hundred or so years has been driven by the improvements in technology that we've had. And that extends to careers and businesses yeah. that we can found as well. I mean, I laugh about the fact that I bought a microphone during lockdown 2020 and started speaking to a webcam and people yeah. all, all, all across the world through Zoom at that point in time. And then that grew into what it is now, which is really, really cool because of technology. But then I can bemoan the fact that I spend too much time on my phone and spend too much time checking social media because there's there's give and take in both regards. Yeah, it's something I think about a lot is is um, the pitfalls and positives of, of technology, really. You know, in my field of work, for sure, having tech, having some technological backup, you know, is, is essential in terms of safety, communications, all that side of things. Uh, and of course, then sharing your story with, with the outside world. It is essential, but equally, you know, what drove me to do what I do was just immersing myself in the natural world, in, in the outdoors. Um, and of course, getting away from technology and thinking back now, you know, I'm, I'm 32. Some of my expeditions, first ones were sort of in my late teens overseas. And I'd be overseas for, for weeks without a phone or without connectivity to the outside world. And I think actually that's something that made those early experiences so powerful because I was immersed in it. You know, maybe I'd found an internet cafe and a message home every couple of weeks or something. But other than that, um, 
and I think that that's something which transfers to everyday life, actually. If you can immerse yourself into a project, into your passion, into something that you're trying to build towards, you know, you're going to just increase your chances of success tenfold um, rather than having all of these constant distractions. One of the kind of big technological like hacks in terms of like controlling your attention and this is something i learned from near real when he was on the podcast he wrote indistractable which is all yeah. about battling back against the kind of powers that be when it comes to a technology perspective is that batching approach so yeah. you have a period where you're logged on and then the rest of that time you're offline now that was an extreme version of it when you're yeah. in your teens abroad somewhere and you log into an internet cafe for an hour across a week or two weeks that's an incredible like kind of sort of digital nomad lifestyle in terms of escaping from it yeah but nowadays, if it's like, I don't know, I have a shut off time between these times and then these times I'm available in that regard, I guess that's the 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 other end. But I understand that in your teens, you were working towards uh, uh, an outdoor leadership degree towards towards the end of that. So you did find something mm. that met those needs in that regard. And it's a quite a niche area. It is. Yeah. And actually, I mean, coming back to my late teens, grown up playing football and rugby, um, had a decent rugby league team at school. We got to the national final a couple of times and could only ever see myself doing that. But at the age of 17, I uh, went on this outward bound weekend, went rock climbing for the very first time. And just that hit of adrenaline of being outside of being so immersed in, in what I was doing was just instantly addictive to me. And, and actually off this one weekend, decided to look into degrees uh, in that subject, found this outdoor leadership degree. You know, who knew that was an actual degree? Uh, I've got the certificate, I can prove it to you because some people doubt it even exists. Um, but it meant that I had three years then of just surrounding myself with people who, who had the same passions, learning from some of the, the best instructors in the UK, uh, and, and really being encouraged to get out into the world. And so that meant that age 19, I was working for a few months in the States. Um, I was trekking in, in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco for two weeks with, with the local guys. Uh, age 20, I spent a month in, in Beirut, in Lebanon. I'd learned a bit of Arabic. And, and suddenly, you know, I'm in this place where you've got bombs going off um, a mile away. You've got snipers hanging out on rooftops, um, seeing all kinds of crazy things. And there I am as a, as a 20 year old, still in uni living with a local family in, in the suburbs of Beirut. And it was just so damn exciting. You know, it was addictive instantly. Um, and he, then to come back into the so-called real world into, you know, by my 99.9% .9 white British Northern town just felt so dull in a way. And so that's where the addiction really took hold. And, and I would describe it as an addiction. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating that while the degree would have been highly practical to some extent as well, you were using those summer periods to very much explore it. Because if you're thinking about your class time, of course, there would be literature and essays and presentations and whatever else and seminars on outdoor leadership and what it meant to be in the outdoors. Mm. But then you were then taking it upon yourself to go and charging off into the, 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 the outdoors during that summer period between, I don't know, May and September when exams finish and then September classes start back. Were you surrounded by classmates that were doing similar? Um, interestingly, not so much, but I mean, in my first year, I heard, I heard about this international travel bursary scheme, which the university had. And I thought I need to learn about this thing. And so the university could give you a grant. It was going on at this particular university to go and travel overseas and do something that you really wanted to do. So I learned everything I, I could about doing the best possible application. I got it the first year then the second year and then the third year as the only person in 35,000 people in that university to get it three consecutive years, just because I'd mastered how to do this thing. And I was so passionate about doing it. In the end, the international department ended up bringing me in to, to consult on, on, on the whole process. Um, but I saw an opportunity there, a golden opportunity, because, you know, student life, you, you've not really got much of an income. You're just, you're just sort of living cheaply, basically. Yeah, you, you said Beirut for starters. Now, if you think about yeah. people's summer holidays during university, it's probably not somewhere as far flung as that. No, although, although that said, you know, I did do the odd uh, trip to Magaluf and, and wherever. And in some regards, that's a bit dodgier than Beirut. So, um, yeah, 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 I think everyone's got to do those kind of explorations as well in, in, in that regard. But during university, you're having these kind of first, like what I would call like real mm. expeditions because a lot of these are solo as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the solo side was something that 
I, I think really appealed to me. And, and the more I did these solo trips, I realized that once you're out there on your own in, in the big wide world, you've nobody to turn to, you've nobody who can help you. Um, if you get into a tricky situation, you've got to get yourself out of it. And actually that became liberating. And, and on, on the flip side of it, if opportunities come up, you can just accept them. You can be whimsical, you can be adventurous. And you know, I've traveled in both contexts, both solo and, and with, with groups and with, with partners and with friends and all, all different dynamics. But there's something about solo travel, which I just think is, is really rich and rewarding and character building. And I speak to so many people who had those experiences as well as, as young people and really found them transformative. And it was exactly the same for me. It's maybe difficult to think back because of how self-assured and confident you are now in your own ability to do that. But at the time, was it something that came quite naturally to you to be able to just up sticks and go somewhere yourself like that? I think in in a sense, yeah, I, I'd always been being the one who say in my teens, you know, I, I would be the one, I'd be sort of the the group leader. I'd be, you know, coming up with the ideas and the schemes and, and the things like that. So, you know, I was used to sticking my head above the water a little bit and I quite enjoyed the buzz of it. Um, and so it, I did feel like I slipped into that quite easily. Um, but, you know, for sure it was a learning curve and there were many things going into it, you know, to take Beirut as an example, again, that, that I just did not have an understanding of as a young person, like sensitivities around around certain, um, you know, cultural sites norms, and yeah. things, things like that and um, how, you, how you should how you should operate. And, uh, you know, thinking about one one specific example where I got a little bit too close to this to this explosion site and got got chased away by some armed soldiers and and just you know now I know the areas to steer clear from I know I know um, how to tap into good it's local like the boundaries, guys. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and it's sometimes you've got to go through those mistakes to really understand the world. I think and understand where you can push things and where you can't. Yeah, to use like a football analogy, you want to play off the shoulder of the last defender and not be offside. But exactly. if, you, if you do step offside and you're younger, you just hope that it's not uh, yeah. something that's calamitous in, in, in that regard. So if you've gone any closer to that explosion site, maybe the, yeah. the armed guards would have taken even further exception. Exactly. If, you, if you're offside every time, then nobody's going to hire you, are they? <laughs> so. in, in those early days, how does it progress? Because post-university, I know you almost stumbled off the path that you're on now and you went into that whole kind of normal nine to five world. Yeah. What led to that? So got out of uni, went overseas for about a year, traveling Australia, New Zealand, all over Asia with, with my girlfriend, got back to the UK, kind of checked the bank balance, thought, okay, maybe it's time to get a proper job like everybody's been telling me. And just fell into this job really after a couple of conversations ended up working at this kitchen manufacturing company uh, in yorkshire and they were they were quite a big company and you know straight away i had this company card laptop phone bonus scheme you know for the first time in my life i had a decent salary and, and all these things and so it was being a student and a backpacker and everything there was an appeal to that for sure um but the longer I stayed there, the more I realized that actually this paycheck landing in my bank every every month um, wasn't giving me satisfaction. This car sat on the drive wasn't bringing me joy. And I remember, you know, I just got into this real rut where I moved from working in design to working in sales. And I was absolutely hopeless at selling these kitchens because I had zero passion for them. My mind was already elsewhere. And I realized that I would probably get fired from that job if I just didn't quit in the first place. So I thought, you know what? Um, and, and actually, you know, to, to be really, to be really honest in the, in those times, I was working from home. I was sort of spending a long time, just lethargic, sitting around, waiting for it was some inspiration to strike, you know, I was, I was miserable, miserable as hell really. Um, and I just realized that I needed to get myself the hell off this corporate ladder, which was just not doing it for me at all. And so then the question is, well, what do I do? And, and the timing was terrible. It, it couldn't have been worse. I was, um, I got engaged to my uh, girlfriend at that point. We planned this, this wedding. Uh, we just bought a house. We were doing a house renovation. 
And so, you know, everything is telling me that this is the wrong move. Um, but I had no other choice, really. I, I fell. And so I quit the job and thought, right, I need to get back to what I love. What's the best way of doing that? Well, by going straight into the biggest adventure I could imagine to really try and establish, establish myself in this world. And, and for me, the idea was to travel from Hong Kong to Istanbul uh, in the middle of winter on my own, climbing mountains in every country. So it's the full length of Asia. And had this idea, you know, really was working out the, the details on the fly, but thought this is what I want to do. As far as I knew, it hadn't really been done before. Um, let's just go for it, like head first, find, see what happens. I, fi I find lots of that incredibly fascinating because like you say, you perhaps went down the traditional route to try and tick the boxes that were important to you. Importantly, and I always caveat this, as many people that listen to this that have found fulfillment in the corporate world. And up until 100%. this point, I enjoy my sales career in the corporate world because yeah. I get a really positive feedback loop from yeah. the skills that I've got that I apply and it comes back with a deal and I know where I'm at month to month. Yeah. But I've worked with many different people who have done sales roles and found that level of um, kind of paralysis that you were finding where yeah. there's maybe a lot of rejection you're facing. You're not as confident on the product. You're not as confident on the on the process. Yeah. And there is those days where you're, you're at home and you're thinking, oh God, I'm going to have to report into my line manager about how many calls I've made or how many meetings I've booked or how many quotes I've done. And it's a case of just, this is just not my bag. And yeah. if you look at how intelligent, articulate, excited you get about speaking about the things that you're passionate mm -hmm. about, it's like that whole um, terrible meme that we see where it's like, oh, if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, then you'll yeah. never understand the the, the the kind of fairness of the system. And And that's absolutely the case with different jobs that people put themselves into and you can understand that desire to escape but i wonder from like a risk uh tolerance perspective your ability to be like right the answer to this is for me to go on a huge adventure because you probably have those experiences in the back of your head saying how good those times were mm. but for me i'm on another side of the coin potentially thinking oh but what does that mean financially how do you pay for the the yeah. house the mortgage etc etc so how do you balance that at that point in time in your own head yeah, good question. I mean, I as crazy as it sounds, I felt like that was my only choice. I didn't have any backup plans. I didn't have another career that I particularly wanted to pursue. All I'd ever known that I'd really enjoyed was doing exactly that. And so I thought, okay, if I'm to do this, I need to go big. I need to go big because it's only if I go big that I think I can make a career out of it. And, you know, I can talk about that as well in terms of how I've developed that into a career. Um, but, f you know, financially, well, I did everything possible to make this thing happen. I ran a Kickstarter campaign. I reached out to businesses. I, I got, um, I even got like schools and little lo local local companies on board. Um, I I did every, you know, I tried to get a little bit of media attention, all, all that kind of stuff. And it was back you know, from a really word. From a really funny perspective, yeah. you were selling the project. Yeah, 100%. And unlike the kitchens, which you struggled to sell, yeah. you were able to sell this project because of your passion and enthusiasm for it was probably a lot more infectious and there's a yeah. little bit more on the line because you don't have the safety of it's okay son we'll uh, we'll, 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 we'll keep you going because your pipeline looks good for the future months or whatever else yeah, yeah. the pipeline had to happen immediately for the project for you to happen so the sponsors needed to come on board the schools needed to get behind it and support yeah. your fundraising so it's really funny for me to take that bird's eye view and be like oh you can sell but you have to sell something you really care about and you have to sell it in a way that you're comfortable with. It's maybe not the traditional email, phone call, walk-ins, whatever other, yeah. other stuff you're up to from the kitchens. That is 100% true. And, you know, I, I do a lot of selling in, in, you know, in, in what I do as well now. And I can tell you that, you know, I would be unrecognizable as that kitchen salesman back then who had no passion, no interest in the product, didn't want to be there. Uh, and so it's poles apart from the way I feel now, absolutely. Some people might be able to do that and hats off to them, you know, if, if they can flog something that, that um, and that's a true salesman, I think. But for me, if I really believe something, um, if uh, I, I believe in my own ability, and actually there's, there's, there's something which I talk about now when it comes to, to goal setting, and I suppose you could apply it to selling, which is, is the three C's um, of, of selling, which is clarity. Are you 100% certain of, of what your vision is, what you're trying to achieve? Um, 
competence? Do you have the skills to deliver that? And conviction, how much do you want it? Are you really, really driven to achieve that? And if in any of those areas, there's some sort of lag or there's some sort of, um, you're not quite where you need to be, then you're gonna struggle. And I, I think about that a lot with any goal. You know, If you can tick all those boxes, you're gonna be right at the top in terms of actually achieving that goal. Yeah, I love that framework and I can completely see that. And if we look at your own example of when you were starting to fund and get in a position to go on this adventure to kickstart what, what is now your career, you can see that you're in complete alignment on those three C's and it's a case of yeah. this has to happen and I'm going to put in the work to make it happen and I'm willing to face rejection or hurdles or inertia, whatever it is, to get there and get towards it. But yeah. it, you eventually do get there. Mm. When was that, 2016? So that was 2016, uh, right at the start of 2016 when I eventually embarked on this trip. And it was funny because I'd spent so much time just trying to get cash to, to pay for the thing, get sponsors on board that actually other than a start point and an end point, 8,000 miles away across Asia, really there was a very bare bones of a, you know, very much bare bones of a plan. And so I had to just fly out to Hong Kong. Um, I didn't know how long it would take. I didn't know my exact route. It was the middle of winter. I was on my own. I had about 11 countries to cross through. And my aim was to climb at least one mountain in every country visited. And I felt, you know, a whole range of emotions, but, um, you know, all I knew was I just needed to move forward one day at a time. And, and for sure that it became a, became a very, very challenging journey. There were very, you know, serious moments of hardship, of, of uncertainty, um, you know, some difficult situations, which, which I could share as well. Um, but it really taught me a lot about that, that need for perseverance and, you know, I think about this a lot today is this idea of, of perpetual motion of just constantly chipping away, constantly, constantly moving. And I picked up this idea from an old mountain guide who, who you know, gave me a bit of training at some point. And, and he talked about being like a metronome. So within a clock, you know, the metronome is always going tick, tick, tick. It's perpetual. It's constant. And I think that's what you need to achieve. It doesn't always need to be a big movement. It doesn't always need to be a big advancement, but if you can keep on just ticking, 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 moving forward, things are gonna go your way eventually. Yeah, I can imagine there's so many lessons from it. And like you say, the different conversation you would have with all these pretty unique people mm. that you're getting access to across all these different countries, different languages that, well, maybe the, you had some Arabic that you'd learned at university, yeah. hadn't you? So there'd be certain countries you go to where you could maybe hold some form of conversation, but people would still try and impart lessons on you in some way or another. And it might even just be physical demonstration lessons in terms of yeah. this is how to navigate this particular physical task. And you're thinking, right, okay, that's new to me. I, I, I understand that. So I find yeah. that I find that fascinating. What stands out on that that first, I would call it like adventure mm. or, or, or quest to you as a, as a, as a kind of key moment? Um I suppose on, on the on the positive side, one of the one of the quirky experiences was I, I managed to experience four New Years within within that that journey just by pure coincidence. So we had the Western New Year, and then the uh, the Chinese New Year. I was in China for that. Then the Tibetan New Year, and then the uh, the Persian New Year. While I was in Tajikistan, so that was just a happy coincidence of being in the right place at the right time. And and one of those that really stood out was the Tibetan New Year, where it's a long story, but essentially, I mean, anybody who knows anything about Chinese politics and, and, and Tibetan politics, it's very hard to travel into Tibet. You need permits, you need guides, all these things. Um, I was on a budget, but I didn't want to do that. So I decided to sneak into Tibet. <laughs> and that meant, um, that meant getting past all kinds of uh, Chinese police officers. They wouldn't sell me bus tickets at bus stations. At every angle, I was being turned away. Eventually, I, I met this. I met this um, this guy who worked for the Free Tibetan Press. He was under watch by the Chinese state. He'd had his passport confiscated, and I thought he's my man. <laughs> and um, and so he smuggled me into the back of his car, drove me up to this mountain village. I mean, it, it sounds like nonsense, but this is this is exactly what happened. In in a blizzard at minus twenty, we arrived up there about four thousand meters elevation. And I was the only Westerner there. You've got thousands of Tibetans uh, traveling to this village. 
as I say, this snowstorm going on, you've got people dancing with, with these incredible Tibetan outfits on, you've got these Tibetan longhorns playing across the valley. And I, yeah, I was the only foreigner, the only outsider there to witness this incredible spectacle. And it remains one of the most amazing travel experiences of my life. Um, yeah, a couple of days later, <laughs> I was caught by some undercover uh, Chinese police and, and kicked out of the village. But uh, yeah, I'd had my moment in the sun there. I was going to say, politically, that is an extremely sensitive area to yeah. go into. And as a Western man in the UK, we probably don't have as much insight into just how hostile and challenging it can be in that regard. But you mm. probably have a better insight than, than most in terms of when you're venturing in there. From a personal perspective, like a danger perspective, how nervous or confident were you in that kind of environment well i just thought what's the worst that can happen you know they could they could get hold of me they could interrogate me they could potentially detain me for a little bit um i think in some regards and you know i don't mean to sound arrogant with this but having a british passport that comes with a certain amount of weight actually so politically in certain countries you can get away with a little bit more uh, having a British passport. And, you know, sometimes that can work in your favor. I didn't create that rule, but that's that's the way it is. And I've seen it. You've got, the, out. You've got personal understanding of that. And yeah. I, 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 I appreciate that because from a diplomatic perspective, people can bemoan the, the level and standard of politician that we've yeah. seen over the, la over the last yeah, few years. Yeah. And I'm certainly in that camp potentially. But I do think that on the international stage, there is still a recognition that Britain is a... A, a big country with weight and high yeah. levels of diplomacy. We've got embassies in many different countries and I'm sure we'll talk about a particular embassy very, very soon. Yeah. But the, the, the nature of you going into these challenging environments, I guess there is a little bit of a confidence that I do have some access to diplomatic support if I do end up with, uh, <laughs> with some challenges. True. Um, yeah, and maybe I can come on to uh, <laughs> maybe the story you're alluding to here, which is which was in Uzbekistan. Yeah, I found that when I was listening to you speak about that on on your YouTube channel and a previous podcast that you've done, I was just laughing because you've you've by this point have you made it through China and so Tibet? You will have done. If I'm, if I'm thinking about the geography, you will be yep. past that point. Yep. So you've experienced encounters with spies effectively yeah. in, in plain clothing kicking you out of tibet and saying don't you be putting your western nose in in here and potentially taking footage or whatever else which is obviously the concern a lot of the yeah. time with china that news and media comes outside with a perspective that they don't want the world to see which is yeah. something that whenever somebody releases stats from china i'm always like well let's just take that with a pinch of salt and or maybe a mountain of salt yeah um but you made it to Uzbekistan, mm. another country that surely when you were thinking about your route would be one of the ones that is perhaps politically the most sensitive as well. 100%. And, and so for people who don't know about Uzbekistan, um, it was an ex-Soviet country, part of what you consider Central Asia, which is Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, these five countries in Central Asia. Uzbekistan, 2016, was considered the the second worst place in terms of human rights after North Korea. That's how bad it was. It's an authoritarian. And you said, you know what? State. Get me in there. Get a mountain for me to <laughs> climb, and let's do this. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, but you know, it wasn't without warnings. And I'd spoken to people on the road. I'd done a bit of research, and people would tell me things repeatedly, um, like. Uzbekistan is not like the other Central Asian countries, it's different. And, and so I knew I had to take that on board. And so to set the scene here, it was, it was late March 2016. Already I've been traveling for about two and a half months, had all kinds of crazy other situations along the way, but I, I was in Tajikistan and was crossing over to, into Uzbekistan. And, and what you do is, is you basically cross these land borders, so you would exit Tajikistan, go across this no man's land, which separates all the borders in the world uh, into into Uzbekistan. And so I had this these, you know, um, reminders just floating in the back of my mind that just be careful in Uzbekistan. And I got there uh, late at night and there was very little traffic between those two borders due to tensions in the countries. And so I was the only traveler there and instantly actually was was greeted really positively. Uh, it was stamped through, sent into this next room, 
and then I'm in this sort of clinically white room with almost like medical tables around. You have three people in, in sort of military outfits and they said, okay, we want your phone, your laptop, your camera, uh, any electrical equipment had to hand that over. Then they started searching through all the files on my camera, laptop, phone, um, searched through every single item in my bag, full body search. And you know, this thing went on for about an hour. And at the end of which I thought, you know, I, I, just racking my brains, like I have nothing to hide. I'm sure I have nothing to hide. There can't be a problem here, surely. And eventually in my first aid kit, they pulled out some cocodamol tablets, which were a perfectly legal drug here in the UK, strong painkiller, but unbeknown to me, um, they are classed as an illegal narcotic in, in Uzbekistan. They contain you know, opioids, so derived from heroin. Uzbekistan, it, it's just north of Afghanistan, which produces about 95% of the world's heroin, major drug trafficking route, uh, super hot on drugs. And so from that moment forward, I was detained as an illegal drug trafficker in one of the world's strictest police states. And yeah, that's when things got interesting. <laughs> In terms of that initial search, how much did that differ to anything you'd been through before? Was straight away you were like, okay, this is more intense than normal? 100%, yeah, yeah. So much, much more intensive, especially confiscating all of my electronics. Um, since then, I have had that in a couple of countries. Uh, but at that moment in time, it was completely new to me. Um, and, you know, very instantly, you just feel like you're basic human liberties are just being stripped away from you. I mean, imagine that happening here. It's like, there's no chance of that happening here unless you're under arrest for a serious crime. Like me as an ordinary backpacker crossing into that country, having everything taken off me, it was unthinkable. Um, and so, yeah, I was completely alone in that situation, just wondering what the hell have I got myself into? Yeah, so they found the Kikodamol. You're in trouble for that because as, as you said, links to the the opium that they'll think you're you're trafficking that into their country and i guess at this point they're looking for something to a stick to beat you with so to speak because they're yeah. not happy that you've you, you've come you've come into yeah. the come into the country how do things unfold from there and what are some of the things that are going on inside your head when these things are happening as well so i was taken away for a four-hour interrogation at the border and it was very very primitive you know i had Again, no contact with the outside world. They were asking me questions mainly in Russian. I spoke barely any Russian or maybe a couple of words. At the end of this, it was about midnight and they presented me with some papers all written in Russian script and said, okay, uh, it's gonna be better for you if you sign these papers. I just thought, I've no idea what these things say. Like, there's no way I'm signing these papers. So I said to them, and this was the first step in me trying to assert some control on the situation because you know they just had me under under their thumbs at, until that point. So I said, look, I wanna to speak to my embassy. Um, and you know, I know that I have a right to do that before I do anything. Um, so next morning, I stayed there the night. They said, okay, you can have one phone call. You got three minutes, There's here's the phone. Called up the British embassy and got an automatic voice message saying, sorry, it's Good Friday. We're gonna be closed until the following Tuesday, goodbye. And that was it, phone taken away from me, back to square one, no you, phone signal. You nothing. know when you spoke earlier about the power of the British passport and I was yeah. thinking, yeah, there is diplomatic support, <laughs> but I knew this part of your story and I was thinking, oh my goodness, imagine having a relative reassurance during this trip that yeah. my British passport does mean something, it supported me in other situations, but when the crunch came, yeah, yeah. unfortunately the diplomats were having a bank holiday. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> they were, yeah, I got, um, got slightly screwed in that situation but um, what has to happen after that because yeah. as you said quite importantly you have maintained an element of you you've actually been disagreeable i think it's yeah. a very important trait sometimes to make sure in any negotiation or any situation that you can try and get slightly back in a level playing field by showing that you're not just going to be compliant with everything and anything of course you have to hand over your electronics you hand over your passport you allow either search but there needs to be an element of well, I'm not signing that. Yeah. Let's just go through the due process, please. I'm on, I'm trying to be cooperative with you, but there's an element of pushback which shows that you're not just a pushover and they're not going to run riot. Yeah, hundred percent. And and I, and I recognize that that yeah, they had my passport. They had you know they just had me there. I was in this police state with no contact with the outside world. Like my position from negotiate for negotiating is very limited, but I had to do what I could. 
And so what I said to them was, well, I want an interpreter who can tell me exactly what this says. Um, and, and they agreed to that. And then I said, I want, I want a local, a, a lawyer or somebody independent who can help me from my side if I can't access the embassy. And so they allowed me that as well. So that was like kind of two ticks in the box. So I was quite happy uh, at least to get the ball rolling. And they took me down to this city of Termez, which is on the Afghan border, not a tourist destination. Um, and, and they took me for blood and urine samples to see, see if I still had this stuff in my system. Assigned me with uh, a lawyer. I'd already been to an interpreter. The lawyer had sat in as well and said, okay, you got two choices. It's 30 days in jail or you pay a fine. Uh, and I said, okay, how much is the fine? And uh, they said, okay, it's going to be a thousand dollars. And I, I came back to them and said, oh, you know, really, I'm a backpacker, don't have much money. And again, this was me just trying to gain some leverage on the situation. Eventually, somehow, they, they agreed to $500, you know. And, and by this stage, people might be thinking, could you not have slipped them some money at the border? That time had been and gone, like I was way too deep into this. You know, I was in the legal system now. Uh, and so, okay, I said, right, $500 it is. But I, I couldn't, I had a bit of cash with me. I couldn't get my hands on the money to pay the cash fine. Uh, in Uzbekistan at that time, Visa and MasterCards couldn't be used. So I couldn't just go and withdraw money. Um, and so what it meant is I, I had to get them to give me another phone call, called home and, uh, you know, told my dad about the situation and, and in the end, uh, he ended up Western Union transferring some cash to Termez in order for me to pay my way out of prison. Um, I mean, the way it went down, I was, I was held under house arrest for five days in this, in this really shabby hotel, I wasn't allowed to leave the hotel room. Um, ultimately got hold of this cash, which when converted to Uzbek currency, Uzbek currency, it, it's so sort of small the denom denominations that um, $500 worth is literally a bag full of cash. Uh, so, and then they drove me out to what turned out to be an ex-KGB compound. So, you know, there I am turning up at this ex-KGB compound with a bag full of cash to pay my way out of prison. And yeah, eventually paid my way out. And, and this guy who'd, police officer who'd been sort of guarding me and just a general pain and harassing me a little bit. Um, he gave me my passport back and said, okay, you know, you're free to leave Uzbekistan now. Your interpreter is gonna take you off to the airport. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I've given up everything for this trip. Um, I have no intention of going home. <laughs> up until that moment, I thought I'd just be able to carry on. But, you know, they were telling me, you need to leave the country. Yes, get out. Yeah, and so this was where I took the decision that, you know, which which 99% of people will be thinking, what the hell are you thinking? But I decided, no, I'm going to carry on. I'm going to continue into Uzbekistan. You had a box to tick, didn't you? Yeah. And I guess from that experience, you decided to be a little bit punchy and say that you were going to carry on. Yeah. It's like, I can hardly describe how much this expedition meant to me. I'd given up everything, everything to be there. Already, like I've been interrogated in China. I'd had a near miss with a, an avalanche in Kazakhstan. Uh, just been through all these different hardships. Was severely dehydrated, and you know, in this very remote valley in Tibet. Later on in the journey, um, and so I thought, well, I'm not giving up. I'm not letting these bastards stop me from doing this trip. And so I got in the taxi with the interpreter. I said to him, look, I'm I'm not going home. Uh, I'm not flying to home from the airport, so I want you to get me a taxi to the mountains. I want to carry on my journey. And he agreed. He took me, o took me over there. And uh, at this point, my priority was trying to contact home. As far as they knew, I was still banged up in some Uzbek jail. And um, so I walked around this little village. It was late at night. Couldn't get any phone signal. Still no contact with the outside world. Walked into cafes. No Wi-Fi. Met some locals. In the end, befriended them, a few local lads who were sort of tough looking boxers and all, you know, gold teeth and all this. And um, they took me out for a few beers and it was a bit of a celebration and it was kind of a F you to the Uzbek state. Lo and behold, they've been following me. And um, yeah, long story short, for the next few days, I was followed around by Uzbek police. They were spying through my hotel room window. I ended up leaving that village at five in the morning. I'd climbed my mountain by then. Um, and basically traveling 500 miles across Uzbekistan on my own, changing taxis in every city because 
by that point, this deep sense of paranoia really set in. Maybe rightly placed because they were watching you. They were watching it was just me. Just one slip, yeah. and they would have been right. Let's get him back in custody. Hundred, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, at that point, yeah, I knew that I'd really pushed my luck, and so I knew it was time to get out of there. I got myself to this city, made some friends in a local hostel. They can be great places for making good friends who are a bit more connected up with the outside world. They helped me get a, an overnight train into Kazakhstan and I made it out of the country. Um, but you, yeah, You've crazy. spoken in some of your content before about the importance of building friendships and connections with local people. You built a connection with the interpreter from yeah. the, 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 the prison effectively. Yeah. What kind of skill set do you have that enables you to do that? So a big thing that I try and do, whoever I'm with, whoever I'm traveling with, is is to be non-judgmental in a, in essence, and and so you know that is that means not judging them for for their worldview um, in in a negative way. Because I think as soon as you start judging people negatively, there's a barrier up, and actually you just can't. You, you're not going to get anywhere with them, you know. And, and so it's being understanding, being sort of diplomatic in a way um and and showing them really that you're just two humans going you know going about going about life and that's a perspective i've taken in in many many countries and it's it's helped me out of a lot of situations actually and so my my default absolutely is to try and you know i can think of many examples where i've had to really de-escalate situations because in certain parts of the world you know where there's no real law and order or where you're dealing with questionable people, armed people, things like that, uh, you do not want to escalate the situation by being con confrontational. And so my way of doing that is by trying to engage with them on a human level, trying to de-escalate, trying to find common ground, understand their motivations, all of these things, um, and just being human, trying to build that human connection. And actually one thing I've found, which is great through travel, is you don't always need to share the same language same culture to do that i was gonna ask that as well because the language barrier is obviously a, a, a big part of that the interpreter wouldn't be but as you said showing up on a, a very open-minded basis as well because in some of the cultures you'll have come across if you drop that person with their particular viewpoints maybe their politics maybe their religion maybe their uh, views on some of the topics that we in the uk deem to be unacceptable yeah. if you met them with that energy in their home turf so to speak you would quite rightly perhaps end up in a confrontation whereas yeah. if you uh, take on board that they they are a product of their circumstance and their environment and their belief system and just work with them on a human level i can see why you're much less likely to end up butting heads in that regard yeah. and I, I definitely have tried this at well i definitely have a an affinity with the vast majority of my guests there's yeah. absolutely been guests that i've had on the show where I don't really agree with their standpoint, but I've yeah. given them the opportunity in air to explain it. I've maybe probed a little bit further, but I've not openly said on air, whoa, I don't, don't agree with that. Yeah. Even though that might've been in the back of my head. Instead, it's much easier to have a conversation and be like, okay, well, why is it you, you feel like that? Okay, I actually understand where you come from now. And I think that is a, a great skill for building connections, network, friendship, and people who are willing to support you as the interpreter did in a circumstance where they don't really have any skin in the game or any reason to back you as a as a yeah. person. Yeah, absolutely. And and that has been one of the one of the skills which I think is transferable to normal life or, or life outside of travel. I'm sure you can appreciate that working in sales as well is, you know, you don't sell something by telling somebody they should buy something. You, you sell something by understanding what they want, what, you know, what are they motivated by, what really pushes their buttons, and then tapping into that and um, and using that for, for your own for your own benefit. Not in a not in a callous way, but in a in a try and create a win win situation. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I definitely wouldn't do well in my role if I didn't have an understanding of what somebody requires and then matching it to from my products and services how how, how i can support them in that regard yeah. and, and that's certainly something I, I want i want to talk about from like what you go on to do now in terms of leading expeditions it's not a case of come and do this tour with ollie france mm -hmm. it's a case of this is the expedition or these are the options for expeditions what are your aims what are things you want to achieve what are things you want to do and you probably build a group around that rather than necessarily yeah. being like 
I'm Ollie the Great Adventurer. I'm going here. Do you want to come? Yeah. It's, it'd be a lot harder selling in that regard, I suppose. Yeah, it, it would. And, um, you know, when we think about what sorts of trips to run, it's really about something which is going to is going to engage with people and and how can you give them that really immersive experience that that is something I've enjoyed and it's almost trying to recreate my early travel experiences for others because that is that is what has driven my passion it's when you can go into a country um, really have these deep meaningful connections and this is why I always use these great local contacts and you know, I, I never just go into a country and just think right we've got our you know we've got our own team we don't need any help we can do everything ourselves no like it, it doesn't work that way you need to use those local local connections and um and for me that just brings so much more to to the trip um and, and of course the other thing is the more i've traveled the more i've connected with very well traveled people and you know heard stories made contacts you just learn about you know where are the absolute gems that we can go to and sometimes, you know, it takes a lot of hard work to get there. Um, but for people who really want to push things as travelers, you know, really have their own adventurous experience, that's something that we've delivered over the years. Yeah, brilliant. And I suppose on your return from this first big adventure, it's enabled you to go on to what you've done now. What ways did that open things up for you in that regard because i guess from like a business and a, a financial and a career perspective i think people listening would be really interested to understand how that works yeah so first of all i mean i got back from this trip it'd been a four-month journey completely on my own i had I'd succeeded in my goals and so the one of my main objectives was to start gaining work as an expedition leader so taking other people on adventures and expeditions across the globe and so you know i remember the first uh the first interview I, I went for um, not long after this and I met this guy also from Wigan who runs runs a travel company called Dylan. He's a very good friend of mine and um, specializes in all kinds of weird and wonderful places. And, and it was really funny. I mean, unbelievably, it's the craziest coincidence of my life, but he had also been detained in Uzbekistan for the exact same reason as me on the exact same border about two weeks apart. And we would relay in these stories, and it was just unbelievable. Um, and you know, we talk had, about building a bond with someone. Yeah, and we had, we had a good laugh about it. And there were other weird coincidences that went on. But you know, I came out of that. It's probably the only job interview where you could talk about being detained as a drug trafficker and end up with a job at the end of it. <laughs> but ultimately, he got it, and he realised that okay, if you can go and do that, you know, on your own then you can take other people with you. So that was the first step. And and so that that became a big feature of my career is guiding people on, on adventures, expeditions all over the world. And, um, you know, for the years between then and now, that might be anywhere between 10 to 15 expeditions a year, uh, guiding a whole range of travelers from all over the world, all different backgrounds. And, and to some of the more remote, dangerous, hostile places, um, places like Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, Congo, all over Africa and Asia. Um, so yeah, that, that that's one side of the career. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about in that side of your career is the target market for that. And I know I actually saw you speak to Channel 5 News about the, the Titanic expedition, yeah. which obviously had tra tragic um, consequences to it and a lot of the people that were on there were extremely wealthy which led to some people taking quite um aggressive stances on their doing so which i found a really strange take yeah but unlike you when you were maybe post university wanting to go and explore that kind of traditional travel gap year period that a lot of people take what does the clientele look like on an expedition now with you to wherever it is you're choosing to go to I mean, it is the most extreme examples of, of society, really. And I mean, if I think about the hundreds of people who've traveled with me now, I've had, I have had wealthy people, um, you know, a couple of people who've been billionaires, a couple of people who've been CEOs of successful companies. Um, they've been, uh, I had an 85 year old terminal cancer patient who I took to Iraq. Uh, he's a really fascinating guy. He, you know, probably the happiest person I've ever met, even though he had months to live. Um, I get people who might be teachers, social workers who, you know, do all kinds of different careers. 
I had a guy who was uh, an ex-CIA operator. Had a guy who was, um, he'd been in jail as a football hooligan for many years. And so, and, and from dozens of different countries. So I cannot, you know, it's impossible for me to ring fence them in terms of one corner of society. But the, the one thing that they do have in common is this desire to have their own adventure. And you know, whatever level of wealth they might have, um, you know, they've put time and en energy into coming, undertaking this this expedition with me. And, and why have they done that? Well, it is, you know, once you're out there, once you have these experiences, it really is priceless. And so that's why a billionaire would be as likely to do it as somebody who works at, at you know, your local Greg's, for example. And, and I, I've had people from both sides. Um, uh, the kind of uniting common yeah. thread is a desire for adventure. Absolutely. Any other traits that you notice that's common among people? Again, people have different motivations. Some people want to travel to every country in the world. So I've, I've had people on my trips who have been to near enough every country in the world. Um, they, I, I think they're, they're probably a bit more risk inclined. Um, although that said, you know, something interesting, which I have observed spending time with, with these groups is the more you, you're, you're in these, these groups who, who do extreme things, you know, you could look at people who go to Syria for their holidays. That's quite an extreme thing to do, but actually when you're in a room and almost all of you have been to North Korea or Afghanistan or Iraq, actually it becomes normal. And so there is this sense of normalizing what you're doing. And you could say that for any extreme, you know, you think of the most extreme things. If you're surrounded by a group of people doing the same thing, suddenly it's not extreme anymore. The baseline's a lot higher. Yeah. Um, if you're in a community that compete at a high level in CrossFit, a particular workout being written on the board isn't daunting. If you're yeah. in a room with people who've been to North Korea and Afghanistan, if you put that we're going to Syria, it's not really that yeah. intimidating. They're kind of like, oh, cool. We're doing that next. Yeah. So yeah, I can com com completely see that crossover. In reverse, when it comes to your client base, what do you think puts people off or limits them taking action on going on an adventure and expedition like the ones that you run? I think a, a lot of the time it is a, a fear of the unknown. I, I really think that is a, a huge factor. And I mean, you tell anybody about Syria and Iraq, what's the first thing that comes to their minds? War. War, bombs, destruction. Um, you know, that has just not been my experience. Um, I have met some of the warmest, friendliest, most humble people in, in, in these countries. And, you know, one fact about places like Syria and Iraq is that 99% of people are going about ordinary lives. They're building businesses, starting families. But of course, that is not newsworthy. You're never gonna read about that in the media. So the only way of finding out is going there yourself and so, you know, I feel like I have a duty and, you know, speaking to a friend about this the other day, I, I feel like I've got two, two duties when I go to somewhere like Syria or Iraq. And you've got to be very sensitive because, I, you know, I've been to Aleppo um, uh, in northern Syria, which was one of the, the most decimated cities in, uh, in the Civil War. We were walking around the city, meeting shopkeepers. They were telling us uh, we were the first, first tourists they'd seen in 10 years. And so the first thing I need to do there and anywhere else is be a good ambassador of the outside world, is show them, you know, that, that we're there with good intentions, um, that we're non-judgmental, that we, we understand them, we're cult culturally sensitive. And then the other side of that is coming back into the Western world and actually telling people, yeah, it's not how you think it is. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 um, some of these places are the most hospitable, most, uh, most fascinating corners of earth. Uh, but there's that fear that is built into us, um, sometimes about, about going somewhere like that or, or indeed any goal, which is, I suppose, out there in the unknown. Um, fear holds people back from all kinds yeah. of things, doesn't it? And, um, I've spoken about this before. I, I'm quite a, somebody who likes quite a lot of control. Yeah. So, and sometimes that can be in, in, in a negative regard if people paint it in that light but I know that when I go on holiday for example I quite like an agenda I quite like a routine I like days where oh it's wide open but we might do this or we might do this my brain handles that yeah. but if there's an expedition and I'm thinking oh gosh I have no control over where this might go somebody with my personality type would find that a more challenging thing to 
let go of the the tiller or the rudder or the steering wheel whatever analogy we want to use and just go with the flow but often that can be the most beneficial things mm. for somebody that's a little bit like myself to just open myself up to exploration and that's why i quite often spend time with friends that are more that way minded and it yeah. opens me up more towards it. it it is an essential part of it actually is is almost letting go and you know i don't say that in a kind of hippie way but um when we join together as a as a team as, a, as an expedition team you know we've got some objective uh, to go and climb this mountain for example we've got people who've traveled in from lots of different places lots of different walks of life they're all there for their own reasons you know the first thing i need to do from a leadership point of view is is understand their motivations and really get them working together as a team towards a common goal um and and that means and sometimes i say this um you know that there is no place for egos you gotta you gotta you know drop these uh these preconceived ideas um about yeah about who you status are status and rank yeah yeah and and you know 99% of people fully embrace this. And I think it's when you embrace that, that's when you can start to build these human connections amongst the team. And and actually, you know, one of the most powerful things about expeditions is that you get to know people really quickly and really intensely. Um, and so I've seen so many lifelong friendships be formed uh, within a matter of days. You know, you, sp you can spend a few days with people, you know more about them than their colleague who's worked with them for 10 years. Because once you start opening up um, and you you allow yourself to to go with the flow, I think new connections can be formed. You know, you can test yourselves in new in, in new ways, and and also you can see that this unknown is not quite as as frightening as as it might have been. Um, so I find it really interesting to guide people through that process. And you know, I've seen so many real transformations at the end of these expeditions. And people, you know, really changed in their entire personality. One of the one of the kind of corny sticks to beat people who do that sort of thing with is like, "Oh, you're going to find yourself, are you?" Mm. And sometimes, for, and I've become much more open minded and more open to spirituality through the last three years of these interviews. Going away into these different places, removing rank, status, following a, a guide, a leader, a support system from that other country that you would never have had experience of previously. Mm is a great way to break down the ego and people talk about through plant medicine etc you can experience ego death and stuff like that and there's definitely merits to consider in that regard yeah. but a lot of people if they do these trips they can be transformative as well and uh, such as the weird nature of the podcasting world I've, I've interviewed this gentleman already but this conversation might come first depending on how it all gets scheduled when I'm, when I'm working my way through it but a gentleman called Robert Robert Twigger wrote a book called Men in the Lousy Modern World and it was all about kind of men kind of losing their place a little bit and yeah. kind of in, in, in how things have gone and it was written back in the early 2000s so it's definitely uh, continued in that regard in, in, in the world up until now and he wrote about a rite of passage mm. and one of the things that he advocates for is a rite of passage is an expedition of some sort some sort of adventure yeah. he walked this huge walk across deserts in much the same way that you did um in, in, in 2015 2016 and he came back and he was like i have so much more perspective now about what i want to do and now he's an author written all these different books about adventures about men's role in society and lots of different topics as well and he said none of that would have been possible if he hadn't opened his mind up on these trips and he's not talking about yeah. plant medicine either which again yeah. i'll probably have another podcast on at some point but this expedition just changed how he looks at things and i think a lot of people if they can just get out of their own heads go into this environment where there is an opportunity to just explore freely yeah uh, and this is one of the reasons why i think a lot about this term ego and when it relates to the outdoors and the mountains because you know the mountains are a great leveler it does not matter what your background is, who you are, you know, anybody could be struck by uh, an earthquake, an avalanche, um, by a landslide. You know, it doesn't matter who the hell you are. When you're up against, you know, the great forces of, of Mother Nature, there's only going to be one winner. So it, so it is a great leveler in that sense. And yeah, I, I think there's other elements to it, especially in a, in a team environment. It's um, you, you've got to you've got to work together. Uh, it, it's everybody's going to have ups and downs at different times, and if you're not there to support each other during their downs, you, you're just not going to move forward. And I think having that mutual goal of a of a defined summit or a de defined endpoint 
that's that's the driving that becomes a driving force between the team um and so it it is a very powerful process for many reasons um and you know it's it's probably you know i got into this line of work partly because i thought it was a great way to see the world now the greatest privilege is being able to work with people from all different backgrounds and to see them have these human journeys it is the people that that drive me to do what i do um and and so it is endlessly fascinating. Yeah, it's it's very very cool, and that's from a, a team perspective. Again, I want to go back to a period when you were embarking on another one of your your large solo expeditions. You'd come back from Somalia, I understand, yeah. and you'd been quite ill. What was going on at that period in time? Yeah, so this was late 2019. Came back. I'd been guiding a trip through northern Ethiopia into northern Somalia. I'd um, then flown home and. Just as I stepped through the door, this, you know, this this sort of wave came over me and I felt really, really ill, like really ill very quickly. And, you know, actually the next day I ended up in hospital. And um, first of all, I had something called Shigella, which is a a food born, um, basically gives you dysentery, really intense fever. So that just completely wiped me out. Um, You know, I was in the hospital for a couple of days. They sent me home, thought all was well but my condition just deteriorated and, and it ended up, I had this, um, ended up with I mean, it's the worst pain I've ever experienced. It was a headache essentially, but it felt like somebody was drilling a hole into my skull. It was so intense that it just pretty much, you know, paralyzed me in terms of what I could do. Um, managed to get down to hospital and uh, it turned out I had meningitis, which is, yeah, uh, well, really, really serious condition, which later learned um, kills about one in every eight people um, on average. So, you know, at the time you didn't want to know that stat though, I guess. No, no. So it's not, it's not amazing odds really. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was by far the most ill I've ever been in my life. Um, I spent a week in hospital and, you know, consider myself a reasonably fit, healthy person, but within, within a week or sort of two weeks overall of this period, just lost loads of body weight, uh, lost all my physical fitness, really. Uh, You know, my lung capacity was diminished, had these banging headaches for weeks and weeks afterwards. And so, but it was in this period, actually, that I was three months, so as I went into hospital, I was three months away from what would be my biggest physical undertaking, uh, you know, solo undertaking that I'd ever done. Well, actually, at that point, it wasn't solo. My my aim was to, (laughs) my aim was to, um, go and trek so lake lake baikal which is the, is the world's biggest lake lies in the middle of siberia 400 miles long same distance as glasgow down to london and my aim was to trek along this lake uh fully self-supported with with a good friend of mine and and um you know we, we planned this thing had everything in the works and in the week i was in hospital he had to pull out of the trip for fully understandable reasons but uh, then I was lying in bed. When it rains, it pours. It pours, yeah. Uh, and I was lying in bed uh, in a hospital, desperately ill, and just three months away from this, what I knew would be the biggest challenge, which I'd always said to myself I wouldn't do solo because of the risks involved. Uh, I mean, you talk, you, you're walking for uh, 400 miles on a frozen lake at the end of the day, very remote. Um, but I had a decision to make, and... You know, this is something I think about a lot to to bring sort of a lesson into this is that no matter who you are, what you, you know, what your circumstances are in life, how great you think you may have it just now, there's always going to be negative events which happen to all of us. We cannot control that. That's going to happen in our lives. You know, it's an unfortunate fact of life. These negative events are going to happen. That does not mean that negative events need to become negative outcomes for us. Is the critical component, and I'm sure you, you know what I'm going to say here, is our response to those negative events. That is where we can control these negative things that happen to us. And so for me, as I was lying in that hospital bed, I realized that it didn't need to be a negative outcome for me. I had influence over this situation still. And so what I decided to do was go for it and and see if I could make it possible. And, you know, got out of hospital. It was horrible, long road to recovery where, you know, normally I'd be I'd be keeping keeping super fit, but even a 5k run absolutely killed me, you know, uh, and I had to get into 
the best possible physical condition to go and undertake a really remote solo expedition. Yeah, in, in the middle of Siberia. One of the most empowering lessons that many of my guests have spoken about in, in terms of recency bias say in the in the very seat you're sitting in, uh, Dr. Aria appeared in the podcast and spoke about stimulus gap response. Mm. And that's exactly what you're describing there. Stimulus, ill, losing weight, partner pulled out of this expedition, gap. Response could be crumble, throw in the towel, bemoan your circumstances, push the expedition back to next year when I'm more capable of it. Probably wouldn't have happened during C-19 either. Would never have happened, no. But instead, you use that period of the gap to decide how how does Oli Franz respond to a situation like this? How does a man of my caliber and means and mindset deal with the storm or the the challenge that comes? That was one of the terms that Ari, Ari used. Even in the cam, you know, the storm will come at some point. Mm. How ready are you going to be for it? How resilient can you be? How strong yeah. can you be in those circumstances? And it, it's, I love that I have guests that explain it in different ways at different times, yeah. but the, the lesson is ultimately so much, like particularly if you're privileged enough to be listening to a podcast for a couple of hours every single week, yeah. you're probably in a position where a lot of the circumstances and things that come your way, there is an opportunity to decide how you move forward from there. The options might not all be fantastic, but there's going to be options all the same that you can choose how that unfolds yeah yeah you, you're completely right and i think the the critical point which which came up there is is that sense of identity and who you really are like what do you stand for as a person what do you see yourself as do you see yourself as somebody who perseveres when when times get tough and you know, there's something I, I read in um, Atomic Habits, which of course is a hugely, hugely popular, hugely successful book, which is, um, you know, consider yourself as the the person you want to be almost. And so, you know, you, you can almost project this confidence onto your future self and say to yourself, well, you know, maybe in the past I've, I've, I've crumbled a little bit or I've not made the right decisions, but you know what? I'm going to say to myself right now that I am the type of person who does not quit when it gets hard. I am that person. And you can reinforce that into your mind. And then when you face those situations, it's like, no, this is the person that I am now. Um, and that is really powerful. You know, it seems it seems so simple, but in some ways it's this self-talk, you know, and, and that is one of the most powerful tools we've got. Um, well, I, I can only imagine that during some of these expeditions, your self-talk will try and self-sabotage in, in, in short bursts. Yeah. But of course, you then have to override it and decide to say, no, one foot in front of the other because my identity is somebody who completes these challenges or pushes himself to the maximum or makes the decision that he said he was going to do. Uh, uh, to heart back to Nia Rial, um, when he was talking about being indistractable, he was like, I'm not the kind of person that checks my email every time I want to or flip, opens my phone and scrolls onto Instagram. I'm the type of person that's indistractable. Yeah. And it's an identity thing. I'm Ollie. I complete these expeditions because that's the kind of person that I've signed up to be for the rest of my for the rest of my existence. Yeah. And it is it's a really healthy framework if, of course, the identity you've signed up for is in line with your values at that point in time and in, in the future. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I mean I can think of one specific example on that on that expedition in Siberia where I really had to contend with negative thoughts and doubts and you know fast forward to march 2020 when i was out there in siberia on my own um another crazy thing had happened while i was halfway across this lake i'd covered 200 miles and was just about to leave behind the last little village before basically 200 miles of complete wilderness up to the northern point in the lake so this is the last point where if you feel like you can't carry on if you've got any doubts, if you're running out of food, kit, all that stuff, that's your last easy point to get off the lake. And I received a phone call that day and it was, um, you know, I had a little bit of signal, received a phone call from my wife and she told me that she was pregnant with our first child. And it just completely like knocked me for six. And suddenly, you know, I got this identity as, as somebody who, who just like pushes through, but then, you know, I'm gonna be a father to a young child in a few months. And, uh, you know, you then feel this sort of paternal instinct. Oh, I, I need to get home. I need to, uh, I need to change what I'm doing. And then I did decide to carry on. Um, 
and, and it was a hard decision. But a few days later, I found myself in a terrible storm. The temperature was quite high, which is actually not not good thing. Because the ice underneath your feet will start to... Yeah, potentially the ice will start to melt, but the, there's also snow on top of the ice, which then just becomes pure slush. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm dragging, essentially, I'm doing about a marathon distance a day, dragging a 60 kilogram sled on my own. Um, in sort You're of temperatures. You're a glutton for punishment, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. like minus or 20. Or challenge, you yeah, want a challenge. Yeah, and some parts where it's bare ice, actually that sled just skids along okay. But when you're in deep, slushy snow, it is literally like dragging an anchor. There's more friction. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so got to the point where I'm about 300 miles deep, 100 miles from civilization. Your easiest way off that lake is by calling in some Russian helicopter uh, at great expense. Uh, my feet are you know, battered and bruised. My Achilles are both swollen. My body is in bits, basically. I've had no contact with the outside world for days. And all I've got to keep me company is the thoughts in my own head, literally, you know? And and so I, I had some serious battles with my mind about keeping going. And I mean, that was an extreme example in a way because the easiest way for me to get out of that situation was to continue walking. Um, and so what I actually said to myself, and you know, it sounds crazy to say it now, but I, I remember saying this message to myself, I am a sled hauling machine. That is my one purpose on life right now. And, you know, for the duration of that day, I would just say that, um, you know, I was probably traveling at less than one mile an hour hauling this thing. It was completely backbreaking, energy sapping. Um, but, you know, you got through, I got through that day and, and the temperature changed a bit and the sun came out and, you know, things, things started to brighten up. But sometimes it is just about pushing through those mantra. moments of hardship. Sometimes, yeah, and yeah. as human beings, we are really quite simple. I've joked before in the podcast and we spoke briefly about politics. Sometimes a really simple political slogan leads to the best possible results for the candidate. Trump yeah. had Make America Great Again. Uh, Johnson won a landslide with uh, Get Brexit Done. Yeah. And I'm sure there's examples from the, from, from, from the left that I'm not as aware of in recent times, but having a really clear mantra yeah. speaks to people on a level where it's like, oh, I hear that. I understand what it means. Proceed. I'm a sled hauling machine. Yes. Keep going. Uh, Goggins, yeah. who's going to carry the boats? He's like, I'm going to carry the boats. Like he just he's a, he's answering his own question in terms of his actions are answering that question, and it's yeah. easy to understand that because it's a physical in, endeavor as well. So no, I, I can com completely see that, and mm. I've heard you say before that resilience is like weather. Yeah. And I really related to that. But for the listeners, what did you mean by that? Yeah. So. I, I think about this a lot in that, um, you know, I do compare resilience to the weather in that, you know, anybody in Britain knows, for example, that the weather outside is not something that we can control. Uh, if it was, it'd probably be a lot more sunny and bright outside. But the reality is that the weather is going to change and sometimes it's bright and sunny. Sometimes uh, it's a bit cloudy. Sometimes really horrible thunderstorms could roll in. We cannot control that. And it's exactly the same with our minds. These negative thoughts and emotions are gonna come into our minds. We have no control over, over these things coming into our minds. Uh, but what we can do and what we can remind ourselves of is that things will get better. Those storms in our minds will eventually pass. And all we can do until that point is just keep on going. But that's something that we can really think about when we're going through hardship know that it's going to pass. It is going to pass. No matter how bad it is, no matter how torrential it seems, it's going to pass. Just weather the storm and keep going. I think I know your answer based on the conversation so far, but how much of that resilience piece is nature and how much of it is nurture that can be worked on? I mean, I think it is, and it's something I've observed so many times. It is something that can be built. Yeah, I've seen this firsthand with hundreds of people from all different cultures, from all different social classes is that we have this deep, innate human ability to adapt and to change according to our environments. So, you know, and this comes down to having this growth mindset, really. You know, we think about a fixed mindset being, um, I am who I am, I have this innate ability, I, I, I don't, I'm not really gonna change, where a growth mindset is, is much more, you no, know, I can change, I can learn from others, I can try new things, I can get better. Um, and, and so, you know, I think reminding, reminding ourselves of, of that fact that we, we do have the ability to change. And, you know, this is why 
this 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 sort of um, talk about adaptability. This is why humans have populated the entire globe from the deserts of the Sahara to the Arctic Circle. You know, this is why we've explored the globe because we are by far the most adaptable species that planet Earth has ever produced. You know, so of course we can adapt. You know, it's an obvious fact that we can adapt. So don't think that you are fixed and you're never going to change. Um, that's just not true. I certainly think it's scalable, improvable. Look at Victor Frankl, man, search for meaning. He just continued yeah. to hedonically adapt to that. In the same way, humans with that hedonic adaptation piece adapt to the things that we buy. So the new car quickly becomes, oh, I don't know. Yes, I've always wanted it, but now I want this or the house that you saved up for three years for with your, with your wife for and you finally got and it cost so much money and you had to make so much sacrifice for quite quickly it just becomes the house yeah and and, and we adapt to that so we adopt uh, adapt very quickly to hardship and challenge but we also adapt very quickly to pleasure and pursuit and whatever else we're, we're working on as well yeah but one of the burning questions i had in my head was around given the expedition expedition sorry are they kind of come thick and fast don't they mm. how do you train to maintain a particular level because of course if a particular challenge is coming up that's more walking based or mm. climbing based or whatever else then you'll maybe have some variation but what yeah. does a kind of standard setup look like for you good question and you know i i have a bit of a, a mantra again when it comes to fitness which is on expeditions uh, stamina equals safety if you're in a remote place and you're unfit you're not going to be very safe out there. So, and particularly as the leader, you know, I see myself that I need to be ideally the fittest person in the team, if not one of the fittest. Um, and so it's very important to me to stay physically and fit. It, it is a part of the job. So a, a base level, you know, I, I always try and maintain a very good base level of fitness. So lots of running, lots of cycling, lots of uh, mountain walking, uh, lots of climbing, gym work body weight body weight work um and you know up, up until recently I've, I've been training sometimes twice a day uh twice a day seven days a week um and really listening to my body um doing lots of endurance and and keeping myself at a, yeah just ticking over at a decent rate but but I will alternate that depending on particular goals. So thinking about the uh, the Siberian sled hauling effort, you know, I found myself on some bleak farmer's field hauling a hauling a weighted sled around for hour specific upon hour. Specific training, isn't it? Specific yeah. training, yeah. Being, being and as you need to be really, possible. you need to be quite powerful at that point because you're moving a weight that's heavier than what are similar to you over a long period of time. So if you were just doing body weight at that point, yeah. it's not going to cut the mustard. Exactly. Yeah. So so you need the power uh, for for that that. And, and you also need to have sort of develop your ligaments and tendons to just take 12 hours of, of sled hole in a day consecutively. You know, when you said that yeah. you uh, train seven days often twice, that makes a lot of sense to me versus what a lot of people would say, like from like a, maybe a, a, an aesthetics perspective or even like a performance yeah. perspective in a particular sport, that would weigh you down too much. But actually, when you consider your expeditions, they are nonstop effort for such a uh, frequent period of time yeah for such a long period of time as well that it makes sense to train in that sort of environment so you probably need to have regular bouts of challenge of course rest in between yeah that allow you to progressively overload towards being conditioned for that environment otherwise if you maybe just did five sessions a week and they were all really hard yeah. as soon as you started doing daily exercise on an expedition your body be like oh we didn't sign up for this we weren't we're not conditioned for this yeah yeah and it, it's something i think about a lot actually and um i think something that allowed me to do the volume that I, that I train at now with with sort of lots of different elements of training as well was embracing the fact that I didn't need to go hard every single time and actually you know just being active you know that that's going to have have great benefits if you can just build build and build um and so you know more recently I've I've sort of embraced this 80 20 rule uh which is is more applied to running generally um or people training for ultras and things like that, which is 80% of the time is pretty easy. Zone one, zone two, heart rate work with about 20% over the course of a week uh, would be the more intense, intense stuff. And actually, once you start doing that, it's quite liberating. Um, and actually, when I think about expeditions, it's very similar to that. It's, it's, very, it's not sprinting at all no, times, is it? It's very rare that you'd have a, a maximum effort 
it's much more slow, sustained, just keep going, keep plodding. Um, and so that is what I need to train for. Fascinating. I really want to know what's coming next. What say, uh, what other targets have you got left in mind? Things that you need to tick off because you've done so much already, so many experiences. You're getting the joy from bringing people on these journeys with you and opening up their minds and giving them that experience. But what's left for you to go after? Well, the next challenge for me is going to be something far bigger, um, far more global um, than I've ever taken on before. And this is a huge project which I've been building towards for the best part of a decade. And it is, is this idea of the ultimate seven project. And so this is my aim to travel by human power from the lowest point in each continent to the highest entirely by human power. So all seven continents, lowest point to the highest. And it is a, it's a truly global challenge. It will involve hundreds of days of expeditions. It will involve all imaginable terrains, deserts, jungles, mountains, um, entirely human powered. It's never been done before, um, never even been attempted before. A couple of the stages have been done um, in terms of the continental stages, but as a whole, never been done before. And so this is something I've been thinking about for years now. I think it's um, you know, an enormous challenge and it's only in the last year or so that I've convinced myself that all the elements are possible. And so now I am making a big push for it and actually next week I'm flying out to Africa to commence the first leg of it. So yeah, watch this space and uh, that's that's the, the big one. Yeah, in incredibly exciting. Given there's so many different terrains to prepare for, that training question, uh, what's maybe differed this time around to prepare you for going from low to high? Yeah, so um, a big element of it will be cycling. So the idea, of course, is to go from um, the, the lowest point, which in Africa is, is a place called Lac Asal, which is in Djibouti. It'll then be a 1600 mile cycle through Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, into Tanzania. Uh, before climbing Kilimanjaro, actually with a with a small group who I'm who I'm guiding up there uh, as well, so that that ties in. Um, that will mean cycling through temperatures as high as 45 to 50 degrees, extremely hot at the starting point. Some very hilly sections, um, but essentially it's going to be a lot of time on the bike. Traditionally, I've done a lot of mountain walking, running, so it's meant over the last few months I've been spending more and more time on the bike. Um, Conditioning your butt and, cheeks. Yeah, conditioning my, my butt cheeks to, to put up with the uh, saddle sores and all the rest of it. Um, and so that's going to be a big factor. S future da further down the line, you know, I'll be climbing the likes of Denali and Everest, which involve huge low carrying efforts at al high altitude. So there's going to be specific training there. Altitude training, maybe lifting something that's heavier on your back. Exactly, yeah. So weighted, weighted hill walks, um, hill sprints, power work, all of that stuff. Um, but certainly, you know, the hope is, and this is going to be a multi-stage journey. So I'll go out, do Africa, come back home, uh, South America in the winter, and then and then onwards with uh, with the planning from there, and and so you know a big part as well you know just to be realistic here is not all intense. I do get back from the expeditions. I have time off, like I let my body breathe, let my body relax, um, and then build it up again, much like a elite athlete would would um, have these sort of low low Periodized, periods yeah. uh in between the seasons and so it's really important to For do your that. body and your head as well absolutely you've got yeah. to recharge and recalibrate and make sure you remember your why before you go again because you'll be mentally yeah. exhausted from 1600 miles whatever it was in a bike your self-talk is going to be <laughs> yeah, yeah challenging but there's going to be that real force of identity to push you through it that that's that's right and and actually the to talk about the mental side again that is something which I've spent a lot of time thinking about and dealing with to a certain extent is is decompressing from these extreme experiences. And, you know, it, it's the classic thought of one day I'd be in the militia run jungles of the Congo or, or I'd be, you know, traipsing around Syria or or being held at gunpoint in Iraq or something. And a few days later, I'm, I'm at home in the supermarket and it's all of a sudden doesn't seem very stimulating. And it, it's... I was going to say stimulation is yeah. a really funny piece because 
your fight or flight system will be used to being active really regularly. But mm-hmm. when you come back into the UK, we live in a time of relative comfort, albeit there's lots of noises and challenges that maybe are financial or something like that, but they're yeah. not a threat to your well-being in the same way that, like you said, you've been held at gunpoint in Iraq, you've been detained in the on the border, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's very different. So like, sometimes your fight or flight almost gets bored and probably mm. tries to trigger you over something that's meaningful as well. It, it does. And I mean, I, I can think of an example I'd had, I can't remember which year it is, maybe 2019. I'd have a, a really busy spring of expeditions. It'd just been back to back. We one, one was climbing the highest mountain in Iraq, which had been a little stressful in the buildup because of the risks involved. And it'd just been a really crazy year and uh, up until that point. And I had this event in, in Dubrovnik. I was speaking at an event in Dubrovnik and then we were, you know, it was kind of a cushy event really. And then we were taken out to this, this nightclub in the evening. And, uh, and I, I just said to myself, I, I'd done a talk already. So I got that out of the way, got this spring out of the way. And it was the most relaxed, relaxed I'd felt in months. And so there I am kind of chatting away and, and socializing a bit in a nightclub and, and just feeling super chilled. And somebody looked at <laughs> one of the guys I was speaking to looked at me and said, are you going to relax? I said, what, what are you talking about? He said, you, you've not stopped looking around the room. And unbeknown to me, I was still on this really high sense of alert. Um, and so, yeah, he was absolutely right. I, I couldn't relax. And I was constantly like observing what was going on. In the, and it's just because you're so used to doing that, it's really hard to switch it off. Um, but, you know, I think I have got better at it now. And yeah. With, with practice comes that. And yeah. Luckily for the people that go on the expeditions with you, you can give them that advice afterwards. Be like, look, you need to decompress. You need yeah. to understand that when you go back into civilian life, if we're going to use like almost a military term, yeah. an operational term, you need to be much calmer and, and wind your guard down a little bit again. Otherwise, you live in a state of hyper stress. You do, you do. And it is it is something I, that I that I speak to with my teams. And, you know, quite often I'll be messaging them afterwards just to check in on them. And I see that as sort of, you know, really going full circle with them uh, because I know it is hard and it does feel like a bit of a, you know, downer sometimes to get back from these these amazing experiences. Um, but of course, you know, sometimes it's what inspires people to go on and, and do more in the future, which is uh, which is also good for, for me, for business. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you've inspired a lot of people today as well, sharing some of the different lessons from these crazy hostile environments, but obviously all the, the training and the mindset work that goes in behind it as well. If people want to continue the conversation with you, where should they head towards? Yeah. So please do come and say hi on Instagram at Ollie underscore, Fra- uh, underscore France. And I will be sharing all things, the Ultimate 7 project. This is really big project um, uh, that I'm just about to undertake. And also got my guiding company, Wild Edge. Uh, so if anybody has listened to this and feels inspired for an adventure, uh, please come and check me out on Instagram or wildedge.co and uh, we'll hook you up with uh, an adventure. Fantastic. Both of those will be linked in the show notes. And I want to say a massive thank you to you, the listener. I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.